Anyone who believes in indefinite growth on a physically finite planet is either mad or an economist. We don't want to focus politics on a notion that involves the rejection of principles around which a large majority of our fellow citizens organize their lives. We are not as endlessly manipulable and as predictable as you would think. It was in the 60s and 70s that the concept really of knowledge work and so on started to come about, of the sharing of data, of the free flow of information. It was the beginnings in the middle of the 70s, late 70s, of the information revolution. And the information revolution was being driven by a very specific Northern Californian mindset. The culture at its heart was a mix of engineering and hippies. It was information will save the world and information wants to be free. That everything could be measurable with data and because of that you didn't need to have hierarchies, that true talent would come out. The idea that information wanted to be free, that the, that the free flow of ideas was how value would be created, necessitated that everybody could collaborate as freely and easily as possible. And so the barriers, the physical barriers between people started to shrink and shrink and shrink. You would start off with offices and then you would go down to cubicles and you would go to the little partitions and today if you go into most high-tech firms or most creative industry agencies, will work in a place which is a completely open plan. And you'll have seen offices and you'll have heard the spiel about how having a completely open plan office will foster huge amounts of collaboration, will foster huge amounts of knowledge sharing, will create, implicitly create, massive amounts of value for your companies and for yourselves. What we hadn't realized when we moved to open plan offices is that open plan offices freak you out. If you have an open plan office where people are allowed to choose where they sit, those of the highest social status, either the bosses or the biggest guys or the ones with the biggest head, whatever it is, however it is you measure, you measure social status, the silverbacks of the, of the room will always be sitting on the edges. They will always have their back to a wall. And the most junior people will always be in the middle. And if you pay attention, if you're very, very quiet and you don't make any noise and you don't startle them, you'll notice that the very junior people in the middle of the room look a little bit like antelope. They are terrified. They're terrified because they are hyper-adrenalized. Because there's a bit of their brain at all times that thinks they're about to be eaten by a lion. Something is behind them. They can't see it. It's possibly a threat. This isn't a rational thing, it's entirely, you know, it's, it's entirely Darwin's fault, basically. It's the thing that kept their great, 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 great grandfather alive on the savannas in Africa. But it's an entirely natural reaction to want to have your back covered. In an open plan office, you haven't got that. So you're constantly freaking out. You're constantly freaking out that people are looking over your shoulder and reading what you've got on your screen. And as soon as you possibly can, you'll move to the edge of the room so that nobody else can see what you're working on. There have been many studies recently looking into the adrenaline levels and the heart rate levels and the stress levels of people who work in open plan offices. And yes, they're collaborating like crazy, or at least they're talking to each other. But they also get sick more, they have more headaches, they're more freaked out. They're less efficient in every possible way. For those of us who work with information or ideas, those of us who work in the knowledge economy, which is basically anybody who's in an open plan office, then focus and concentration during the process are just as important as communication after the process. There is a growing fashion, and we'll talk about it, I'm sure, in the Q&A later, of software companies going back to lockable offices to having doors that shut behind you, to enable people to stay focused for a long period of time. This is a very important situation. 
today. For everybody in the, in, the, in the Western world who's been sophisticated enough to have a smartphone for a couple of years, you'll have noticed that this gives you extra superpowers. It enables you to locate yourself in the universe within three feet. That's a pretty cool superpower. It enables you to speak to anybody, no matter where they are on the planet. It enables you to know all of human knowledge just by moving your thumb. And because of that, because of these special capabilities that we get from these devices, because of the habits we get from these devices, it's enabled us to have new ways of working. It enables us to be in contact with our office the entire time. It enables us to collaborate the entire time. All of these things could be brilliant. And they're brilliant because they're measurable. It enables you to, as companies, to measure the response time of your employees. You're able to start judging people on how quickly they respond to their emails. Some of you as bosses might perhaps judge some of your um, subordinates by how quickly they reply to an email that you sent to them at 10 o'clock on a Friday night. Or some of you might be really worried that you're being judged on how quickly you get back to an email that's sent to you at 10 o'clock on a Friday night. And this ability to measure these outcomes and to automatically measure these outcomes is what comes from this sort of technology. But the ability to measure stuff, the ability, the ability to count what you're doing, can lead you to some horrible false decisions. Because it can lead you to be measuring the wrong thing. It can lead you to optimize for the wrong thing. And I would say, to, at the moment, we're optimizing for communication and collaboration far too much. If you're trying to do any form of clever work, if you're trying to concentrate on anything, if you're trying to write something, if you're trying to think something, you have to get into what's called a flow state. The flow state, it takes about 20 minutes to get into it when you're really on a roll. The default email checking time on Microsoft Outlook is 15 minutes, which means that in most offices, unless, they, unless you turn your email off, assuming you're allowed to, given a moderate amount of email or traveling across an office, you will never get into a flow state. The technology is making you a little bit brain damaged. It's actively preventing you from doing good work. Because it's difficult to measure good creative work, but it's very easy to measure things like email traffic. We have optimized being on top of things rather than getting to the bottom of things. And it's time today that we start to reassess the tools that we've been using, start to reassess the technology, start to reassess our offices and our chairs and the way we sit and the way we talk to each other and all of those things, reassess the way that we actually work against what it is we're trying to achieve not how we can best use the tools. As Marshall McLuhan said, first we shape our tools and thereafter they shape us. And we are in the middle of an information revolution where we are allowing those tools to shape us. In that way, offices and our culture within those offices are not a reflection of ourselves, but are a force upon us, a force upon our character. And if that's the case, then the interplay between ourselves and our technology and our working lives is in fact society itself. If we don't reassess, and it's very hard, if we don't reassess how we deal with email, we can't really solve any other problem in society. Perhaps the future of collaboration, the future of social media, the future of email and all that sort of thing is less of it. Perhaps the future of social media is saying no. Perhaps the future of intra-office creativity is telling people to go away more than we do today.
This is a technologically driven phenomenon. In large organizations, we find that that is being driven by the technology departments, by the people who are in charge of buying the cool stuff. And they buy it for different reasons than the reasons we want to use it most of the time. So again, this requires a much wider discussion, a discussion about the cultural change that's necessary within our places of work and within our organizations. And some people will say, well, what's the point, you know? Really, what's the point? It's just, it's just my email at work. It's just like Lotus Notes. It's just SharePoint. You know, it sucks, but well, really, it's just this thing at work. But you know, this, <laughs> this reminds me when I was 11 or so. So when I was 11, I went to a new school. You know, everybody goes to a new school when you're 11. And the school I went to, they, um, the fashion there was that everybody had a particular type of sports bag. And of course, I went to my, you know, my mother, and, 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 and I, I begged for one of these bags. I mean, I need one of these bags. Don't you love me? <laughs> Please. And you can guess the conversation, you know, money doesn't grow on trees and all of that. And, and my mother said something to me which I've never forgotten. She said, why do you want such a fancy bag? Said, it doesn't matter, it's only school. I thought she was incredibly wrong. Because it's only school to her was, it's only your entire life for me. <laughs> You know, my school life was my life, and not having that bag ruined my life, mother. <laughs> and I wanted, at least, to try reinventing myself with this one of these bags. And society makes progress through consideration and design and constant reassessment of the status quo, often of the most banal things. In fact, generally, always of the most banal things. Because it's the banal things, the everyday things, which are the most important things. We put up with stuff because, you know, it's just school. Or it's just work. But it's that, banal, it's that banality which is where the real opportunity lies. To really go forward... We need to look at every aspect of our lives. And we need to reassess everything that we do based on the future rather than based on somebody else's idea of how things should be done from the past. And if we spend our lives in offices, if we spend our lives doing knowledge work sat in front of a glowing rectangle, then perhaps that's where we should start. Thank you very much. I'm interested in power in all of this, because one way of looking at what you're saying is that, is that the two things that you talked about were presented by managers as things that would liberate staff, but were in fact underpinned by a power relationship. So the open plan office was supposed to be about collaboration. In fact, it was about surveillance. Yeah. The, the technology was supposed to be about giving you autonomy and control over the work process. It was in fact about surveillance and control. That's right. Is that, I mean, where is power in your account? I think it really depends on the different company. You know, of course, in some places, it was just very purposefully done like that. And in other places, uh, you just have these power relationships come naturally. There's a very uh, famous example of this. The TBWA in um, the, the uh, advertising agency 10, or 10, 15 years ago. And um, they moved offices, and they moved to a much bigger office. And Jay Chiat, who was one of the directors at the time, he had this idea that... Um, he would create a completely flat organization, completely hierarchical. And so what they would do is he would give everybody a mobile phone, a laptop, and a locker. And it was enforced hot desking on a daily basis. And then it was, there was a clean office policy every evening. 
And the idea of it was that everybody would move around and they would all learn from each other. And one day I'd be sat next to you and you'd teach me something. And another day I'd be sat next to you and you would teach me something. And, you know, and it, um, it made absolutely everybody miserable. They hated it. It was a massive disaster. It was written up when it first started as being this great, futuristic, incredibly egalitarian, amazing thing. But of course, people are people, and some people don't like other people, and some people have to sit next to other people for reasons of work, and, and, and it just it doesn't work. There, it, it takes away, I think one of the, the paths to that power relationship is it takes away the respect for the social relationships that make up an organization. If we're going to have the conversation that you think we should be having, that might be a conversation which is better pursued by workers together talking to each other about the working conditions they want and talking to managers about that. Because it's quite difficult for that conversation to take place on the basis of individual conversations when I'm your employee and I'm saying to you, you know, I quite like to have my own office or I'd like to have a tea break. So do, do you think, actually, one of the things that's going to, to have this more fruitful conversation is to go back to the idea that workers need to be able to organise together and have a collective voice? Should that ever happen, they'll be able to do it with, with, with a background not just of um, sort of labour theory, as it were, but also they'll be able to say, and it's better for the business, and, it's, you know, and we will produce better work. One thing I didn't touch on, but it's, it's a sort of bugbear of mine, is, is, is sleep. There are certain professions specifically have this very strange and abusive relationship with their employees' sleep. Specifically, you know, pulling all-nighters or working late at night, staying in the office really late. My favourite statistic of all time is, for, is that if you are one hour sleep-deprived every night for a week, by the Friday morning, it has the same effect of, on your mental state as being over the drink-drive limit. For junior copywriters or for you know, junior architects or, or, or something like that, who, for whom the office culture is you don't go home until 11 at night because you don't go home until 11 at night, effectively, their bosses are making them stupid. And if you were to turn, and, and we have lots of companies where the culture is, you, you, you know, you turn up to work on a Friday morning and you look and you've got a huge thing of coffee and you say, oh, you know, I've pulled three, all, you know, I've been three late nights this week. And nobody's like, yeah, you know, rock on, you know, macho, awesome. If you turn up to work on a Friday fully rested but a bit pissed, you know, you'd be sacked. It's the same thing, actually. Now, we're starting to see many companies uh, or some companies, forward-thinking companies, actually putting a stop to this. Um, there's a couple of uh, French banks, for example, who turn off their email server at 6 p.m. Just turn it off. And some companies uh, turn off email server, turn off their uh, internal email on one or two days a week. Just force people out of the habit of doing that, of doing those things. Because they're tiny habits, but when you add them all up, it not only is really bad for you as a person, but it's really, really bad for you as an organisation. Never mind the higher minded things of you know, labour relations or something like that. Just remains for me to ask you to join me in thanking Ben Hamza.